SIP. So uh, the recording, uh, we, we recorded, uh, we already recorded the, the last uh, discussion. Yeah, so yeah. the videos will, will be available online. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Ah, oh, that's great. No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I started recording right now, uh, Paulo, and uh, afterwards I will send you uh, the video. Okay. Yeah, no, that's Thank fine. you. Hi, Herman. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, Ulrike. Hi, Jasper. Hello, Herman. How are you? Paulo. Hello. Good to see you all. Awesome. I was I was panicking a bit because of the the date on that was indicated for the link, but I realized only afterwards that that that, that doesn't make any difference. I mean, it's the uh, you can change. Yeah, the but uh, I realized that after I sent you for uh, I've sent you for for, for you, you for the, the participants, and then I realized that so the the big. Uh, diffusion, the, the, the link we shared on Facebook and by mail for all the members who are ready with the correct date because uh, I thought well it's the same link but it might be confusing so we, we corrected it before. That's fine. That's fine. So we are yes. we are six at the moment. We are going. <laughs> going. <laughs> Philippe, ne never panic about a theory of sexuality. No, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the latest there is no reason. <laughs> the latest news, Herman, about my back, you know, that I fell. Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had a broken rug. Is that so? Yeah. Toch yeah. wel? Oei, oei. En ook, en ook verschoven of zo? Nee, dus dat is allemaal oké, okay, maar dus ik zal moeten wachten tot het overgaat. Nu, dat is met alles zo, maar... Uh... Ja, dat is met... <laughs> Ik zal niet de uiterste consequenties hier wel trekken nu, maar uh, ja, dat klopt. Maar dan ben je wel eventjes mee zoet, denk ik, of niet? Uh, dat duurt wel even. Ja, ik moet maandag nog eens terug van de naastdokter om te zien wat ik moet doen. Hey. Oh, ja. Zeg, qua um, organisatie gaan we eerst jullie die presentatie laten doen en dan uh, meteen daarna al de discussie. We can, we can, ik zou dat Ulrike... Uh, so, um, uh, so we would we do first the the uh, presentation. presentation yeah. uh, Herman Herman will will read the text. Yeah. I mean, and then uh, and then the the two um, uh, responses. Yeah. Okay. And then we provide uh, the opportunity for the general audience. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think my my talk is about fifteen to twenty minutes, something like that. Okay. Uh, and I think that is also the case for Ulrike and, and Nicola. That was uh, yeah. 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. I will get a glass of water. Yeah. You are giving the talk together, uh, Philippe. Uh, Herman? Herman, Herman presents the text. Okay. Herman wrote Tarfons. Uh, uh, Herman uh, wrote uh, wrote uh, a, 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 a short presentation, so he will he will present. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we split it in two, but but it's only. Um, and he wrote it. Okay. At what time do you want to start, uh, Jasper? Maybe we should. Um, uh, Nicolan is. We should at least wait, wait for at least five or ten minutes. No. Yeah. See yeah. What you're, you're yeah. Final song. Pedro. Good to Jasper. see you. Ça va? Hello. Está mudo, Nelson. Seu microfone está desligando. Ah, ok. Salve, Filipe. Ça va? Salve, ça va, ça va. Et toi? Ça va très bien. Je suis content, tu viens. Tu n'es pas trop confiné. Pardon, je ne t'entends pas. Tu n'es pas trop confiné là-bas, euh, à Sao Paulo. On est davantage plus confiné. Euh, ouais. Pandémie. Oui, c'est dans un moment très, très critique. 
Oui, oui. Non, je peux l'imaginer. Et au Brésil, ça, ça n'est pas évident, si je comprends bien. Oui. <rire> Ce n'est pas du tout évident. On ouvre cette discussion-là. On ne pourra pas discuter ton livre. <rire> It's like Trump brought to the extreme. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Hi, uh, hi, Leah. Mm. Hey, Leah. Nice to see you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely. Talking, talking about Brazil, I, I'll have to leave early because I have to, to catch my, my, my daughter at school. It's her last day today again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, in this. Our school, uh, schools open in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Paulo. They are open uh, as well as churches. The, the, three days ago, the governor uh, declared that churches are essential services in, in Sao Paulo. <laughs> and, but the, 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 the schools themselves are, uh, are organizing themselves to close uh, because it's impossible. It's just not. So this is what's happening. It's really crazy. Let us hope that Darwin will do some job for us you now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all the supporters of Bolsonaro are from that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 Pentecostalism. Uh, it's, it's unbearable. It's, uh, no, I can't. No, no, I don't. I don't envy you. <laughs> no, no, we are not to envy. No. <laughs> Hello. Hi. 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 Hi, Nicholas. Hi, Hi Nicholas. Hi, Nicholas. How are you? I'm fine. I think I was having some trouble with my connection, so I'm oh. sorry for my for being. Four minutes late. Sorry. No problem. I was planning to 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 write Nicola, uh, but I, I'll do it after the meeting to make a new appointment to discuss the the La Planche thing uh, we were writing about. You're writing a La? Uh, no, 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 no. The 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 the, the, the discussion. I mean, the discussion. The mail exchange we had. Uh, so to, to, to talk about it uh, through Zoom or something so that we can go to, because I'm very interested by, by uh, your response. But okay, well, I'll write on that. Well, my presentation will contain a lot of Laplanche in any ah, case. Voilà. Okay. <laughs> so. So I think we are complete, right? Nicolas, Herman. Okay. Speakers are complete, yes. Yeah. Should we should we start with the presentations or do we want to wait for other possible participants? Maybe just still another minute. Yeah, maybe. Uh -huh. Hi Ulrike. Hi, oh. I mean this time. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you all. Yeah. Is uh, is Eschne going to going to participate? I don't know. Do you do you know Herman? No, I haven't heard anything. I don't know. Hi Davy. Oh, I see you on the. Hello, Prof. Hello, everyone. Bye. Hello. Hello. Bye. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, yeah. So welcome everyone to this uh, meeting for the book discussion of uh, Philip van Houten and Herman Wistrim's um, work on uh, the three essays. So just to give a short introduction, because I, I believe most of you know Philip and uh, Herman, so I will keep it condensed. So Philip is a professor of philosophical anthropology at Radboud University 
and a professor of philosophy at the University of Pretoria. He's a psychoanalyst, of course, at the uh, Belgian School for Psychoanalysis. He has published numerous works and several books on the relation between um, uh, philosophy and psychoanalysis. He is currently finishing a book with Hermann Westering in Dutch on the seduction, drive and repetition, Freud's metaphysics of trauma. And he is preparing another book um, with Hermann Westering again and other colleagues um, on uh, Freud's uh, groundbreaking work, The Insights des Loose Principes. Then Herman Wistering is uh, the other author of the book. He's an associate professor of uh, philosophy of religion and intercultural philosophy at the Center for Contemporary European Philosophy at Radboud University in the Netherlands. He's also a professor for psychoanalysis and mysticism at uh, the KU Leuven in Belgium. He is the vice chair of the scientific board of the Sigmund Freud Foundation in Vienna. He has written uh, numerous books and articles on Freudian psychoanalysis, uh, sexuality and religion. Most recently, he published a monograph in Dutch language on Michel Foucault's history of sexuality. Um, he is the editor of the book series Sigmund Freud's Werke, Wiener Interdisciplinaire Commentaire. Together with Philippe van Outen, he is currently finishing a monograph on Freud's theories of Trauma. So we'll, we will begin with a presentation by uh, Herman and afterwards uh, give um, the floor to our respondents, uh, after which we will uh, provide the audience with the opportunity to, um, well, to offer some discussion, to have, offer some questions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, voila, here you go, Herman. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jasper, for uh, the kind introduction and uh, giving uh, us the, into the opportunity to present our book. Uh, I think some of you may have already read it uh, or know a little bit about it from, CIPCO, pre from previous SIP conferences where it was also already uh, discussed um, uh, or parts of it discussed. So maybe just to uh, refresh your memories. Uh, as you all know, Sigmund Freud published the first version of the three essays on the theory of sexuality in 1905. It is a central text in the founding of psychoanalysis. And yet, as Philippe and I show in our book, it is also largely and strangely enough, an unknown text. For in the following decades, Freud kept rewriting his three essays. He republished them four times between 1905 and 1924. And each time he added large paragraphs in which he introduced new theoretical insights that he had uh, developed or discovered in the meantime. As a result, the 1924 edition of the text is almost twice as long as the original one from 1905 and it contains theoretical insights that contradict Freud's original positions uh, of 1905. It is this 1924 edition that was published in the final officially approved collection of Freud's works in which it received the reference 1905D. This at least partly explains why the first edition of three essays was never published in any la language other than German until a few years ago, when Ulrike Kistner, uh, who is among us today, uh, made a first translation of the 1905 edition in English. Of course, to a certain extent, we all knew through the work of, of uh, James Strachey that the 1924 edition of three essays covers 20 years of theoretical developments in Freudian psychoanalysis. But even the most experienced, experienced Freud readers have had, uh, had had a, a hard time distinguishing between the passages that were in, introduced at different moments and that for that very reason belong to different theoretical contexts and have to be judged accordingly. The subtitle of our book, From Pleasure to Object, indicates with what is arguably 
uh, the most important theoretical shift in the theory of sexuality throughout the various editions. The first edition of three essays can be read as, first of all, a radical dismissal of the approaches of, to sexuality of Freud's contemporaries, such as Kraft Ebing and others. They're actually Freud, Freud's predecessors, one would have to say. These eminent scholars continued a dominant train throughout Western thought tradition, arguing that sexuality should be defined in functional terms. That is to say, in terms of a genital drive that is basically equivalent of a reproduction instinct. From this perspective, there could not be proper, in, proper infantile sexuality. Uh, also, in this perspective, all deviations from the functional sexuality were to be regarded as abnormal and pathological. And these pathological and abnorm abnormal formations will be listed as the sexual perversions in the end of the 19th century. But what if, Freud asks, when the sexual perversions are in fact building blocks of what we generally call the normal vita sexualis? And what if the perversions are in fact fixations of components of the sexual constitution of all human beings? These and like questions bring Freud to formulate a theory of, in of infantile sexuality in terms of polymorphous perversity and autoerotic pleasurable experiences of one's own sensitive body parts and zones. In this context, Freud clearly states that sexuality is without object. That is to say, the sexual drive is not naturally aimed at an object or any specific object. Objects merely play an instrumental role in a variety of activities aimed at autoerotic pleasure. As radical as the dismissal of his predecessors may seem, Freud's initial theory of infantile sensu uh, sexuality is in a sense spectacularly unspectacular. The polymorphous perversity and autoerotic pleasurable activities, such as sensual sucking, are described by Freud in terms of mere physiological processes. Impulses and impulse receiving sensitive organs and zones causing excitation and pleasurable ticklings and itchings that the child seeks to repeat in rhythmic movements. No fantasies are involved and no transgressions are made. Cultural norms are as yet without any real significance. Of course, in 1905, this is not the whole story. For in the final essay on the transformations in puberty, Freud reconnects with the traditional perspectives on sexuality. The transformations in puberty are such that, the normally, that, that normally the outcome will be the functional sexuality Freud had criticized in the first essays. The primacy of the genital drive is installed and is from now on aimed at reproduction through heterosexual object choices, normally. Cultural representations and norms fill in the further details. In short, what we find in the first edition of three essays are two distinct regimes of sexuality, the one infantile and the other adult. But what about the relation between or transition from one regime to the other, from pleasure to the object? How and why is the first infantile realm of pleasurable autoerotic activities transformed in such a way that in puberty the primacy of the genital function can be firmly established and sexuality becomes object related. In our book we show that Freud notably in the 1915 edition introduces or one might maybe say strengthens a developmental perspective in order to argue that there is already an infantile sexu in infantile sexuality a development towards genitality. Also, in the year after the first publication in 1905, Freud discovers, notably in the case study of Little Hans and also in the study of the Red Man, that already in infancy, clear object choices can be witnessed and all kinds of sexual fantasies and sexual theories are already produced. 
And this leads Freud to conclude that the object is introduced in two phases, the so-called diphasic object choice, namely in infancy and later again in puberty. Also, Freud will argue from 1915 onwards that these sexual developments, including the reaction formations against certain sexual activities and pleasures, and also frustration, anxiety, and even object choices themselves, follow phylogenetic patterns and schemata. There is an influence of the experience of previous generations that co-determine the normal sexual development. And this changes the status of culture in the organization of sexuality and moves the object choice forwards. That was backwards, in, uh, backwards, I would have to say, in infancy. From pleasure to the object. Our reading the various editions of free essays includes a critique of the many Oedipal readings of Freud's work. The classic form of such reading holds that after the alleged abandoning of the seduction theory in 1897, Freud, through several years of self-analysis resulting in the interpretation of dreams, discovered the importance of Oedipal fantasies for the structuring of sexuality and object relations. In our book, we claim that such an assessment of the development of Freudian thought is completely at odds with the theory of a non-objectal infantile sexuality as presented in the 1905 free essays. Our reading of the various editions does show a gradual, as Foucault and others would phrase it, oedipalization of Freudian thought. But this oedipalization only starts from the cases of Little Hans and the Red Man onwards and comes to full maturity only in the 1920s. In fact, the introduction of the Oedipus complex parallels the turn to phylogenesis I already mentioned. It is no coincidence that the importance of the Oedipus complex is first fully recognized in Totem and Taboo. The Oedipalization of psychoanalytic theory is part of Freud's attempt to found the human sexual constitution, development and organization on a universal phylogenetic ground. Now, does this mean that we can also witness gradual Oedipalization of the free essays, that is of the various editions until 1924? In our book, we show that one should be very cautious here. First, there is the simple fact that although there are many theoretical editions in the various later editions of free essays, Freud never adds a section or paragraph on the Oedipus complex. To the contrary, one might add. It is as if the Oedipus complex is deliberately avoided while only mentioned twice in footnotes added as late as 1920. One could raise the question as to why the Oedipus complex is never really integrated in the theory of sexuality. Let me briefly mention two aspects that we think are important. First, if Freud would have chosen to integrate the Oedipus complex in the text, he would really have to been forced to completely rewrite the theory of infantile sexuality. The introduction of the notion of diphasic object choice, I already mentioned that, is in itself already at odds with the idea that infantile sexuality is strictly autoerotic and without an object. So you see already tensions in the text appearing in the various editions. Does such an introduction not pave the way, I mean the introduction of the diphasic object choice, does that introduction not pave the way for a further Oedipalization of the theory of sexuality. Why did Freud then not introduce the Oedipus complex? Well, maybe, yes, it paved the way. But at a closer look, a closer look reveals that matter are more complex. The infant's object choices are partly based on sexual theories motivated by self-interest and rivalry, the question of where do babies come from? Also, the idea of the diphasic object choice seems to offer a kind of, you could say, solution 
for problems and questions concerning the polymorphous perverse building blocks of infantile sexuality. For after all, there is object relation in sadism, in voyeurism, in fetishism, hence in the perverse components of infantile sexuality. But to fully integrate the Oedipus complex would much further undermine the theory of infantile sexuality of 1905. It would make it very difficult and probably impossible to maintain that the paradigm for infantile sexuality would actually be sensual sucking, the pleasurable autoerotic activity. The Oedipus complex would uh, not only introduce the object, but also genitality and sexual difference from the outset. Second, one might wonder whether and in how far the Oedipus complex is actually about sexuality. When we assume that identification is at the heart of the complex, the Oedipus complex includes a process of desexualization. At least, this is what Freud claims in his 1920 reflections on identification in mass psychology. Um, also, the complex includes the element of aggression and formation of the superego. But again, why would this all be relevant for a theory of sexuality? When integrating the Oedipus complex in the free, in free essays, Freud, Freud would have ran the risk of having to expand on all kinds of theoretical topics that are not evidently part of a theory of sexuality. In fact, uh, it would probably mean the in introduction of a conceptuality that would disrupt the conceptuality of 1905. And we think here we also find the reason why, for example, the death drive was never integrated and introduced in the editions from 1920 and 1924. Our critical remarks concerning the status of the Oedipus complex in Freudian thought and the limits of Oedipalization have consequences. Psychoanalysis have, has been severely criticized in the past and with good reasons for its heteronormative approach to sexuality. This approach can take many forms, but it is almost always linked to the Oedipus complex. A critique of psychoanalytic heteronormativity, therefore, would have to entail a critique of the role accorded to the Oedipus complex. The first edition of Free Essays contains a theory of sexuality that doesn't anticipate the later Oedipal theories. Quite to the contrary, the 1905 edition identifies infantile sexuality with non-functional pleasure and discusses this relation without reference to an object or to sexual difference. And this approach allows for a critique of a binary conception of sexuality and more generally of sexual identity politics that characterizes not only conservative theories but also some feminist theories of sexuality. It is not without reason that I briefly referred to Foucault. In his history of sexuality, he raises the question whether we can think sexuality in non audible terms. His, su his suggestion is that this is possible when one turns attention to what he calls bodies and pleasures. In support of this, of this Foucaultian look, at this, in support of this, Foucault looks at cultures and epochs in which there was an established art and practice of erotics. But maybe one could argue that Foucault could have also looked, uh, in a sense, closer to home, uh, to the early Freudian theory of infantile sexuality, the non oidable Freud of autoerotics and bodily pleasures. If, as Foucault claims, one of the questions of our time is how to think and rethink sexuality. Freud's theory of infantile sexuality and the gradual oedipalization of his theories are not only of historical, but also of philosophical interest. I think this is where I uh, end my introduction to our book. Uh, I think I introduced a lot of uh, topics, I hope,
it was all more or less clear for you. Uh, the different topics are worth discussions, of course. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the uh, responses by Ulrike and uh, Nicola. Okay, thank you, uh, Herman. So we will proceed with the first um, respondent, um, Dr. Ulrike May. She's a practicing psychoanalyst in Berlin and a member of the Carol Abraham Institute in Berlin, the German Psychoanalytic Association and the International Psychoanalytic Association. She has published uh, several uh, psychoanalytic uh, books as well as numerous papers on the history of psychoanalytic theory and practice. The last one about the conversation between Freud, Abraham and Ferenczi on mourning and melancholia in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, together with uh, Michael Schröter in 2015, she presented a critical edition of Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle, including a transcript of its first version um, from 1919 that had been not published before. So I give the floor to uh, Ulrike. Uh, thank you very much, Jasper. Uh, I would like first to introduce myself to you because I have the feeling that I'm a guest and I'm you. And so I would like to say a few words uh, about I. Uh, it happened that I got to know you. Uh, I met Philip and Herman uh, several years ago at the Congress uh, about the history of psychoanalysis and I must add we liked each other immediately at least I liked them both I don't know uh, and I probably wouldn't have liked them if their way of working was not similar to mine and so we are in the center of our subject I think but uh, well we then kept a bit of an eye on each other the similarity in thinking has been confirmed over the years, at least that is how I perceive it, and I'm pleased to be able to say something about their new work today. You can see from this preliminary remark that I'm biased. Something else you cannot see, but I want to tell you is that I have worked out my own approach to psychoanalysis in a long engagement with that psychoanalysis that is represented within the International Psychoanalytic Association. Even though I'm not identified with it, in all likelihood, my standpoint is still informed by my past and my training, I guess. I say this because I'm a little afraid that I will understand you as far as you are members of the SIPP, not as well as would be desirable. And on the other hand, I expect not to be understood by you as I would wish. Incidentally, I don't have this problem with Philip and Herman. We understand each other very well. What is this book by Philip and Herman about? A book which I consider a little masterpiece. It deals with Freud's theory of sexuality between 1905 and 1923. The period after 1923 does not appear. The period before 1905 only in a rudimentary form. The focus is on the three essays on the theory of sexuality with its five editions, including the enlarged edition of 1924. The authors concentrate on Freud's writings, whereas Freud's correspondence and the minutes of the psychoanalytic society in which Freud frequently discussed his theories are not included. As far as the publications of Freud's students and colleagues are concerned, the authors limit themselves essentially to Adler and Young. You will hear 
from this description than what I would have wished from the authors. Although I have to admit that they have written an admirable, good book, even without these sources. How do the authors proceed? I mean, in the best way one could deal with the text, namely by examining the changes in the text. The authors are not only interested in the thesis themselves, but in the manner in which they have changed over time. Their method is, I would say, similar to that of Marinelli and Meyer, for example, who examined the metamorphosis of the interpretation of dreams, or to what I did with Beyond the Pleasure Principle. In doing so, however, the authors suspend the assumption that the later is the better or that the later is necessarily an improved version of the earlier. For them, it is an illusion that we expect progress at time as time advances. One could say with Donald Moss that the authors hold the view there is no last word. The authors argue this principle with particular force and go even a step further when they demand that we should also suspend the principle of the unity of the person. If I understand them correctly, they want us to treat the different versions of the three essays simply as different texts. I quote, different texts present different theories. This is a very, very strong thesis that we could return to uh, in the discussion. I would describe their method as anti-dogmatic, unusual, unsparing, and very fruitful. I find that in this way, they discovered a new Freud and a new theory of sexuality precisely because they bring to the fore statements by Freud that we had been had become accustomed to overlook because we considered them in need of correction as outdated or aberrant. The book contains so much that is new that I will limit myself to the first two chapters. Also because the third chapter brings quite unfamiliar new thoughts that I first have to digest myself. One of the main findings the authors present in the first two chapters when examining the different editions of the three essays is that the first edition of 1905 contains one radical view of human sexuality that was too lost in later editions. Freud's radical thesis is that infantile sexuality is autoerotic, objectless, and polymorph perverse that is not yet centered on the genitals. We know this thesis of Freud's and have become accustomed to putting it aside. We say that this cannot be true because from the beginning, the child is related to an object, to the mother, to the breast, breast or, so, or something else. The authors found that Freud himself soon abandoned this thesis, probably in the course of analyzing Little Hans. In any case, already in the second edition of the three essays of 1910, Freud states, that even this very small child makes an object choice by which Freud means that an object outside the ego is chosen, an alien object as Freud sometimes calls it. And this would happen as Freud indicates from the second edition onwards already in early childhood. Now, why? is Freud's thesis on the objectless character 
of infantile sexuality radical? The author answer, it is one, because Freud does not connect sexuality with procreation, and two, because he pays so little attention to the object and instead places the striving for pleasure and excitement at the center. What matters then is one's own satisfaction and not the object. As the authors write, I quote, it is a theory of sexual pleasure and excitation, not a theory of sexual desire for an object. In addition, Freud describes the object as arbitrary and variable, thus distancing himself from any heteronormality. Infantile sexuality is, in his view, distinctly egoistic and self-centered, and this is in stark contrast to our contemporary view of sexuality, and probably also in contrast to the view people had then in 1905. Freud is, as I would say, anything but politically correct, and in this sense he is radical. I would add that in psychoanalytic literature very often sexuality is seen as a thoroughly object-related matter, and it is and also and it is also clear that this is how it should be. There is a definite morality against anything autoerotic, non-object related or narcissistic. It seems to me that this stems from a basic Protestant attitude of our society. It is if, as if there has been a transformation of Freudian psychoanalysis into a Protestant psychoanalysis with a strong emphasis on guilt and renunciation and with a rejection of autoerotism and narcissism. Both are considered as immoral and sick today, whereas Freud saw in the egoistic search for pleasure the central, so to speak, innocent characteristic of the sexual. This is what Philip and Herman brought to our attention, and I fully agree with them, and have myself pleaded not to put aside this thesis of Freud's, but to take note of it as an important and, as I believe, accurate description of sexuality. At one point, Freud takes it to the extreme and says, at its core, Sexuality is narcissistic. This is from the minutes of the psychoanalytic, Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. Perhaps we will come back to this in our discussion. But let me add that I understand Freud's assertion that infantile sexuality is objectless as implying a narcissistic relation to the object that is within the realm of sexuality, the object is not treated as an object with wishes and feelings of its own, but it is used or fantasized for the purpose of one's own gratification. And in this sense, sexuality is without a real object, without an object outside the ego. But we may come back to that. The last point I will pick out relates to the Oedipus complex. I do this because the authors have found an answer to a question that has been bothering us until now. Why is the Oedipus complex practically absent from the three essays? It shows up as Herman said already, only in two footnotes, and those were inserted very late in 1920. In Freud's writings, as is well known, the Oedipus complex is mentioned for the first time in the interpretation of dreams from 1900, 
and then disappears. It shows up again in his writings in 1910, but only from about 1920, Freud ascribes to it the importance that was later adopted by many psychoanalytic schools. Several authors have already noted this, but I do not recall that a plausible answer has been found. Phillips and Herman's answer is complex, and I will only deal with one layer here. For it follows from what has already been said. A concept like the Oedipus complex was not compatible with the concept of infantile sexuality from 1905. I don't agree with that, but perhaps we come back to that. The authors write, I quote, as long as Freud considered infantile sexuality to be essentially non-objective, Oedipal problems belonged to puberty. That's exactly how it is, and we must be grateful to the authors for stating it unapologetically. We all recall, recall passages in Freud's writings before 1920, in which we were surprised to discover just this. It has always been irritating, and we have so far managed to escape to later works, namely to The Ego and the It of 1923, where Freud formulated the full, so-called full Oedipus complex for the first time, and now anchored it in the Oedipal stage around the fourth year of life. And this happened only in 1923, at the end of the period in which Freud was elaborating, as I believe, his main theories. Philip and Hermann have much more to offer than I can mention here. There is only one final question I would like to raise. Do the authors believe that the de-radicalization they see with regard to Freud's understanding of the sexual drive also apply to other concepts or perhaps even to Freud's entire oeuvre? And do they have any ideas what the reasons could be? I would like to conclude with this. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Ulrike. So I will just um, yeah, give the opportunity to Philippe and Herman to um, respond to several of the uh, essential and very interesting points you made in your uh, presentation. So, um, voila. Um, yeah, Herman. The microphone, Herman. The microphone. Sorry. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jasper. Uh, and, and thank you very much, Ulrike. I think that, uh, well, it, it doesn't really matter who first starts the response, uh, Philippe or, or me, but uh, Philippe will certainly add something. Uh, uh, thank you very, very much for your very kind, uh, for your very kind words, uh, Ulrike. Uh, as you know, we also are great admirers of your uh, work and very much inspired by your methods of uh, reading texts of Freud and the complexity of texts. Uh, that has been very uh, important for us. Uh, in fact, that was, of course, the first intuition uh, that steams from, let's say, publications such as the, those from Marinelli and uh, and Meyer, but also your work on the insights, Ulrike, and others who have, uh, who have shown that it is important to look at the way that uh, several Freud key texts are compositions. And that is to say, uh, have, have become more and more uh, expanded throughout the years, not only interpretation of dreams and free essays, but also the insights, uh, the case of the Wolfman, 
the, uh, the, the text on the psychopathology of everyday life. There's a whole series of key texts that, uh, that have various editions, you could say, or are a composition of, uh, of moments in time and different theoretical insights. So to understand Freud is a meticulous exegetical and historical work in the first place. I think uh, if one of the, one of the fixed, fixed, uh, things that you raised uh, Ulrike, very early in your talk was uh, that we did not really include uh, the correspondence and the minutes. Uh, I think to a certain degree that was uh, a conscious uh, decision, although maybe not completely conscious, uh, but we did talk about it, of course. Uh, because we wanted, on the, f in, in, on the one hand, to have a clear contextualization of the editions, also of 1905 and the later editions, obviously, and to include Adler and Jung was important in that respect. At the same time, we didn't want to make the text too historical and to bring in too much details from, for example, other correspondences and minutes um, um, that would, of course, uh, if we would have done that, the book would probably have doubled in size. <laughs> uh, and and but the question that would at the same time would have been would it have added really something new uh, or decisively new? That is okay. You can we can discuss that, but um, it was it was it was deliberate. Uh, to on the, on the one hand give a good contextualization, on the other hand not too much historical work. Um, another uh, thing that I really uh, liked about what you were saying was the way that you listed, of course, uh, again what the infantile sexuality for Freud is, how it is, how it has been largely recognized and at the same time disregarded by post-Freudian thought. Like everybody knew that there was polymorphous perversity, but nobody really knew what to do with it within an audible reading of Freud, right? And then it becomes a marginalized factor, you could say. Whereas indeed we try to, uh, to open up the text and show the radical side of Freud at the same time, of course, we try to do that, I think, uh, uh, in a very nuanced way, showing especially that, that Freud never is only, let's say, uh, uh, simply radical. <laughs> because the third essay, for example, is already another theory of adult sexuality in which he is far less radical uh, than in his theory of infantile sexuality. So it is also very much opening up a kind of polarity, polarity or a kind of tension within the writings of Freud uh, that show how you can uh, think about sexuality, but also maybe also why it is so difficult to be only radical. <laughs> because there's also all, always the other side of sexuality, right? You can, you, you can be so, you can be radically anti-heteronormative, but at the same time, the heteronormativity is also there, and most people are just heterosexual persons, you could say, at least in Freud's mind. That would, in the end, be normal. So there is also this tension and this uh, spectrum, you could say, within Freud's thought. But that's exactly what makes him so interesting. And then the final question, but I think here Philippe would also... Uh, that is a difficult question, I think. The question that you raise, whether there is a de-radicalization of Freud's theory of sexuality, and whether that is maybe in fact part of a more general trend within Freud. Uh, spontaneously, I would say, um, uh, at, it, at first sight, maybe yes. Maybe yes, in the sense that in Freud, in Freudian thought, and certainly when he has his students and his followers, there is a tendency towards a certain dogmatism, if you want, a, a, a certain tendency to, to, to provide uh, a unified theory which has its core concepts, its core fundamental ideas. Uh, you, you know better, Ulrike, than I, 
about uh, how they controlled, how Freud and his students also controlled the group of psychoanalysts and were constantly battling heretic points of view within their own ranks. So there, there is this tendency. On the other hand, I think that now that Philippe and I are again working on working on Jainsites, there is hardly any example, I think, of somebody who is capable of, despite being, uh, despite maybe a tendency towards institutionalization and dogmatics in his own theory, is capable of suddenly disrupting and undermining his whole thought. Uh, in that sense, for example, a text of like Jainsites is as radical as the first edition of free essays. I mean, in a certain sense, in the sense that somebody is capable of questioning a whole theoretical body and saying, maybe we should look at this at a, in a completely different way uh, again. And that is, that is in effect, that is an amazing, uh, that's an amazing quality of Freud to be able to do that. In that sense, I would say, he remains as radical as he ever, <laughs> as he always already was, exactly in this attitude mm. being ca of having a kind of intellectual freedom to question mm. what was already established. And that happens in the three essays in 1905, questioning the work of his predecessors, but it also happens in Jainsites when he questions his own theories sort of in a very fundamental way. And there are other moments, I think, in his work where he is doing that. So uh, maybe Philippe would like, wants to add something to that. Well, I only have a few, a few things uh, to add like that spontaneously. First of all, uh, uh, thank you very much also, uh, Ulrike, for your uh, kind uh, words. Uh, obviously, the, our reading and, and the way we, we, we read um, three essays is, is in many ways um, um, uh, inspired by uh, your uh, work on, on, on Freud and, for instance, on uh, Jensides as loose principles, where exactly you, you confront and you explain how this, this text is a composition, just as um, three essays is one. And so um, for us, it was, uh, so I was very, and I think I can also speak for Herman, I was very happy that you could accept the invitation to uh, present something at this occasion. That being said, I, I also had um, um, uh, what you, uh, with regard to your remark on uh, Herman and me not using uh, or not more using the the um, the um, correspondence, the, 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 the minutes, and so on. Um, I have to say, um, I well, it's an easy it's an easy answer. I agree. <laughs> I would follow. I would. I would say. I would answer a bit along the lines Herman already did. But I would add this. Um, I, I. I admit that um, over the years, and that is over the years that we have been uh, discussing uh, on the work of Freud, I became uh, much more uh, convinced that 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 and sensitive to to the argument. It's clear. I think we were Herman and I when we were writing the text. We were, I think, uh, Herman uh, has to correct me if I'm wrong, but we were um, maybe also out of enthusiasm uh, for some reasons, uh, thinking that uh, or placing the, the changes in Freud's text against the background of changes in the history of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And I think that was that is the implicit reason why we uh, didn't uh, stress too much the discussion with Jung, for instance, and when it comes to sexuality, the discussion with Jung is absolutely crucial. I mean, you know better than I, with, 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 with Abraham, with, with all his pupils. And so I am, I am, I, so I'm very, um, yeah, I, 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 I think you're, you're right. On the other hand, as Herman said, if we would have taken up all of that material into the book we have written, uh, there is a risk that it would explode. I mean, because then it becomes so complex, uh, also historically, that it maybe can no longer be 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 written in a, in a way that is understandable. So it has two sides. But on the on the the the, 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 the on the argument itself, point taken. Um, Maybe also, I, I was very um, um, uh, happy with your remark about there is no last word. Um, I think uh, 
and, and it's, it, 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 it brings me, it brings us back to Herman's last remarks. There is no last words. Um, it's it, because in Freud, ultimately, there is no last word, precisely because in all the texts we are talking about here now, but also, and especially in three essays, different positions are present at the same time. And so, so I think one should not read these texts as uh, answers to a question or as a kind of established or as the expression of an established theory, but as a field uh, in which uh, different positions are brought into contact and into debate with one another. And I, that's, I think uh, uh, that was a bit our, our idea. If we do that, Freud becomes a very interesting author, also for us, a contemporary author. Even if very, uh, on, on numerous occasions, he defends positions that, um, that uh, for us, for instance, psycholemarchism, just to, to mention it, that for us are difficult to, 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 to defend or to, 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 um, yeah, to accept, but still, um, in the, so there are different, different positions that are also, and still are positions, brought together, brought into debate. And, uh, and, and so if, if you read Freud like that, um, without, uh, thinking that the last position is his true position and his own, and so on, then it becomes um, a field of reflection. And I think that that's important if we want to keep Freudian thinking around and uh, alive. And that uh, I would like to link that to another uh, remark you made, and that I was also very happy about uh, when you said that uh, in in our reading we um, we remind people of passages in Freud that were easily forgotten because we thought that they were in need of correction. And it is indeed, um, and I think that's an important uh, aspect, if I may say so, of at least what we wanted to achieve. That is, there is a tendency, not only in the Lacanian world, but also in the Lacanian world, at least, but Kleinians and so on, to read in Freud what we already know from Lacan, from Klein and so on, and not let Freud speak for himself. And Freud is not a Lacanian, let's be clear, and is not a Kleinian, Freud is Freud. And so we try to, 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 to read without immediately um, over-interpreting Freud through, all, through everything we know from more recent authors. And I think that that's an, an, an important task that needs um, to, to, to be done. It, it's just, it's, it's an anecdote, but um, well, my past is partially at least Lacanian, and I cannot hide that, and I'm not uh, unhappy about that either. But it, um, it's, it, it creates a problem be when you read Freud, because as Hermann uh, just uh, re uh, told you, we are working at the moment on the insights. And so when we send texts back and forth, quite often I have to put in the margin, isn't this formulation too Lacanian? Mm -hmm. Because I, know t I, I realize myself, I've, I'm, of, I'm interpreting and reading in a certain sense, and that's not Freud. So that is, so I think indeed it's true to, I think we, we need to, to try to, and uh, your work is a good example, to, to, to try to get back to uh, something, uh, to, 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 to Freud, if you want, eh? un vrai retour à Freud. And, um, and this, and, and then of course, this is, this, this, this Freud is interesting. So we don't need Lacan to make Freud interesting. Freud might be interesting for other reasons than uh, Lacan thought. Um, that's, bon, I won't go into that. It's, it's, um, I have one question with regard to autoeroticism, a uh, question to you then. You, you say, if I understand you well, autoeroticism, uh, auto, so the, the autoerotic uh, status of infantile sexuality, uh, you, would, you would link that to uh, a narcissistic relation to the object. But would you say that that's already the case in 1905? Yes. You would say, yeah. So that's, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, that's <laughs> what I wonder. I mean, <laughs> because of course, I have the impression, and I think that's the position we take in the book, but if I understand you, if I understood you well, you don't agree. I would think uh, infantile sexuality in the 1905 edition, I see in later texts 
why you say, so in later texts, I see why you say what you're saying, I think. But in the 1905 edition, uh, infantile sexuality comes very close to mere ticklings, something that can be described in purely physiological terms. Yeah. Which is, for that reason, very non dramatic. It's a very, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, so it's like, I don't know, I don't know if somebody can translate that. I don't, I only know the, the, the Dutch expression. It's a bit like, as it jeukt moet de krabber. When it's, uh, <laughs> how do you say that? Um, if it hitches, you scratch. Yeah, if it hitches, you scratch. Um, and uh, so, um, so I, I don't see in the, in the 1905 edition in what, because there is no, it's object laws, he says. So how can the relation to an object, how can we think an infantile sexuality as a narcissistic, narcissistic relation to the object. That, so that would be my question there, especially specifically with regard to the 1905 edition. Well, uh, you, I, I don't know to what I, what I should respond to because both of you said such so many interesting things that I would like to respond that I have to pick out the last question you posed. Mm -hmm. And well, and I would like to, I think I have to apologize that I said what I had wanted you yeah. to study because, well, these are my terrible, uh, terribly super ego and, and, and um, expectations that are plaguing me and I hate everybody that is not plagued by these uh, these wishes what else everybody should have read and so on and so on but I would like to uh, respond to your last question and I think this is a sort of a one million dollar question um, but I would like to say what I think. Well, I agree with you that in 1905 it's difficult uh, to see what I think could be seen. Um, but I will, um, I will read to you a passage, uh, 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 something out of the minutes from 1909. And I do this, I would like to do this also to show you how fruitful it is. I tell you these min minutes are really a, uh, and shots, a treasure. Uh, it's unbelievable what you find there, what you will find there because Freud discussed uh, theories in advance and very often years in advance he proposed to the society thoughts that he published only years later and so you get a, a more complete history um, of his theories and what I would like to draw your attention to is the I think famous session uh, at least that is what I have stated uh, from November 9 in 1909. This was the evening when Freud introduced the narcissistic face. And he said, I read only to you the sentence that is important, I think. Um, Narcissism in 1909, the introduction of narcissism, you know it as well as I do. Officially, he mentioned it only in 1911 and, 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 and. But this is the first time when he mentioned it in the, in the society. And it started, I think, with psychosis. But I think more important is what he thought about homosexuality. He responded to a paper that Satka had given, and he said, Satka's remark about narcissism, narcissism was a perversion as any other perversion, it was described as a perversion before Freud. Satka's remark about narcissism is very new and valuable. 
narcissism is not an isolated phenomenon, but a necessary developmental stage of the transition from autoerotism to object love. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, the boy loves not only the mother, but only he, uh, but also himself, mm -hmm. and what he, and he loves in others what he thinks is uh, similar to himself. So Freud, you you can see how it really he doesn't separate it. He says first this and then this. Mm -hmm. So um, he didn't have any problem. Uh, with his concept of autoerotism because he just didn't care uh, if it is compatible or not. Oh. This is what I think. He didn't care. He didn't put so much emphasis on a synth synth synthesis to bring everything together. He, he didn't care. He said, we see this autoerotism, narcissism, and we see that. We see the love of the mother. Don't ask, don't put any questions. That is what I see. And um, so, um, well, this is my first response. I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time. There are other people who, colleagues who want to say something. That's my first response, but many responses may follow. Philip and Herman. This is not my last word. We'll be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be very happy. We're looking forward to that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, that sounds really promising, but I'll have to uh, continue with our next uh, respondent, uh, Nicolas Epsonas. He's a psychoanalytic therapist in private practice in Paris. He also a PhD in literature and a PhD in psychopathology and psychoanalysis. He is currently teaching in the Department of Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Paris. He has published numerous papers on clinical and applied psychoanalysis in French, English, Greek, and Portuguese peer-reviewed journals, as well as essays on films, ancient and modern Greek literature. His research interests focus on gender and sexual diversity at the intersection of metapsychology, feminist studies, and gender theory. Most recently, he has been a guest co-editor uh, of a special issue of uh, Psychoanalytic Inquiry on Sexualities, Gender, Class and Race, a Psychoanalytic View from France. He is now at the moment finishing the edition of a double special issue of the Psychoanalytic Review on Trans Subjectivities and Countertransference with a Trans Epistemological and Transcultural Scope including uh, many contributions by leading scholars from all over the world. So I will give the uh, floor to uh, Nicolas for his response on uh, Philip and Hermann's work. Thank you, Jasper. Hello to all seat members, and thank you very much for this invitation. In these challenging times of COVID-19 and multiple lockdowns, it is essential not to lock down our thinking and creativity. This is why I'm especially delighted to participate in this virtual discussion panel and very honored to take the floor after my distinguished colleague, Ms. May. Um, reading Freud's three essays on the theory of sexuality is such a compelling, engaging and rigorous project and I congratulate the authors. Since time limitations do not permit me to extensively review the incredible richness of your book, I'm going to focus on a few key issues that you raise in your microscopic analysis of the original 1905 version of Freud's seminal work on sexuality. I would like to begin my presentation by stressing the innovative methodology of your project. You write, according to Freud, the creation of psychoanalysis consists of a progressive movement of digging deeper and removing disguises, a hidden truth that was always waiting to be found. What was imperfect might be replaced by something better, end quote. Contrary to this teleological conception of metapsychology as a coherent unity, 
that was progressively developed and consciously controlled by Freud, which would imply that the core of Freudian thinking lies in his last works, you underscore the groundbreaking originality and pioneering insights of the first edition of the three essays. Further, you show the multi-layer character of the Freudian corpus, its tensions, and even its inconsistencies. This palimpsestic approach is so much more than the archaeology of knowledge promoted by Michel Foucault, that is a historical reconstruction of a very primary object that you like to call the missing object. Your methodology is authentically psychoanalytic because it embraces the psychic process of the après coup, that is, the regressive and progressive movements that emerge in the analytic treatment, which are neither linear, that is, moving from one point to another, nor circular, that is constrained to repeat themselves in the same sequences. To borrow a metaphor from Laplanche, your work allows us to follow a spiral movement which constantly distances itself from one pole while simultaneously returning repeatedly to points along the same vertical. You note that your research is in line with the work by Lydia Marinelli and Andreas Mayer on the different editions of the interpretation of dreams and Ulrike May's rereading of the various versions of Beyond the Pleasure Principle. From my French perspective, your method is also deeply Laplanchian, since you read Freud against Freud, thus, let me call it Laplanche, transposing the Freudian method from an analysis of the individual and his desire to the exigencies of a body of thoughts or to what on the discursive level is most closely related to this desire, end quote. In other words, you show that Freud's three essays, when considered in its entirety and diachrony, is shaped by its very objects, namely the unconscious and its logic. As such, its richness lies as much in its contradictions and lacunae as in what it explicitly states. Take, for instance, the utterly autoerotic concept of infantile sexuality depicted in the first essay in sheer contrast with the object-related and rather heteronormative approach of adult sexuality in the third essay. Also, recall the description of the endogenous child's eroticism on the one hand, and the involvement of the primary caregiver's sexuality in the child's pleasure on the other. By using what I have just termed Laplanchian methods, you can shift from controversy to complexity. I refer here to the epistemological paradigm used by philosopher Edgar Morin, physical chemist Ilya Prigogine, or Argentinian psychoanalyst Leticia Glosser Fiorini. This type of complex thinking accepts heterogeneity, although it does not always offer a dialectical synthesis. Further, it's not limited to binary polarities, but is rather based on disjunctive conjunctions, thus promoting the interplay between the theorized object and the theorizing subject. Complexity, which shares affinities with the Deridian deconstruction, allows for the meticulous analysis of the theoretical counter-transference that permits Freud's three essays. Contrary to the interpretation of dreams, which presents itself as a great empirical book, where Freud multiplies the examples drawn from his analytic experience with patients and initiates a paradigmatic dream of clinical counter-transference, I'm referring here to Irma's dream, Three Essays engages a transferential dialogue with the theoretical corpus, the psychiatric and sexological work of Richard von kraft Albert Moll, Magnus Hirschfeld, or Havelock Ellis. Through a close intertextual reading, you illustrate how Freud's insights, 
mark an epistemological break from his predecessors, while at other times his innovative vision of sexuality surreptitiously espouses this tradition, thus compromising his groundbreaking ideas. He also take into consideration the reactions to Freud's new radical starting point for the theory of sexuality within the psychoanalytic movement and argue that the following editions can be read as responses to these reactions, otherwise said as transferential fruits of rivalry among peers. John Forrester writes, psychoanalytic writing is not just writing about psychoanalysis. It is writing subject to the same laws and processes as the psychoanalytic situation itself. I think that your work goes far beyond this statement. It actually demonstrates how psychoanalytic writing, which is evidently determined by the unconscious forces that it endeavors to describe, cannot be considered outside of the author's social norms, scientific milieu, or historical inscription. In this way, you contribute to the postmodern debate about situated knowledge. Let me recall here the definition of this concept introduced by feminist scholars Donna Haraway and Sandra Harting in the 90s, um, who aroused new questions about objective knowledge and its supposed epistemological neutrality. I quote, Intellectual work is always situated in a double perspective at least. On the one hand, the research object is socially and historically determined. And on the other hand, the researcher's view of his or her object is influenced by his or her disciplinary orientations, his or her theoretical references, his or her place in the social world, and his or her personal and professional experiences. End quote. Accordingly, the concern with situated knowledge that pervades your work encourages to reflect on the conditions of subjective enunciation. I, I also like the concept of pathoanalysis that you bring to the discussion. You argue that the 1905 edition of the three essays likens psychoanalysis to a sort of pathoanalysis, which can be understood as a clinical anthropology. This is very interesting, and I think that we can conceive in pathoanalytic terms jokes and their relation to the unconscious and the Dora case, which were both published in 1905, and of course, the Psychopathology of Everyday Life, published four years earlier. You write, the study of pathology becomes what we call the pathoanalysis of human existence. Human nature, as such, can best and probably only be studied from the perspective of the psychopathological variations." End quote. In other words, pathology expresses universal, ten universal tendencies and anthropological concerns through the lens of exaggeration. Seen in this way, perversion ceases to be a solipsistic structure or a demonized fixated category and instead becomes a generalized feature of human sexuality. To stress the overlapping dynamics between different psychopathologies, you recall the famous Freudian statement, neurosis is the negative of perversion, which we easily understand as the neurotic negation of the polymorphous partial drives of infantile sexuality. I would like to ask you here whether you differentiate between perversion and perversity, and whether you think that it is nowadays clinically and epistemologically relevant to continue using the term perversion which is closely tied to social and cultural norms and thus runs the risk of moralizing the clinic. Why perverse and not diverse, for instance? In addition, I wonder whether we could conceive something more radical than the pathoanalytic model. 
which you view as an alternative to the Lacan-inspired psychic structure and mutually exclusive identities. Can we completely escape from psychopathology, even dismantle the very notion of category, by instead thinking in terms of the creativity of the symptom and the processes of subjectivization in the analytic treatment, which go hand in hand with transference mobility and psychic transformability. I'm thinking here as a clinician, and this is a crucial question for me when I'm with patients, so I would like to hear you, what, what you think. Uh, at the very end of your book, you propose extending the pathoanalytic model to new problematics, such as transgenderism. I find your proposal intriguing, and I myself consider that trans subjectivities illustrate in a paradigmatic way the generalized trauma of gender and the universal uncertainty of identity that results from the splitting of the speaking subject. In my view, this pathoanalytic conception overdetermines the violent, even primary reactions to a transgender bodies which are systematically reduced to a mere transphobia that quickly closes the question. Having said this, um, you seem to associate transgenderism with infantile sexuality. What about gender? This notion introduced by Robert Stoller in the uh, 1960s is not unanimous within the psychoanalytic community and I would really be interested in having your feedback. I have my own thoughts, but maybe I should hear yours first, or may I say a few words now, Jasper? You can, um, I don't know what you prefer. You want first a response by Philippe and Hermann and engage with their, um, it doesn't matter. Oh, maybe I should finish, okay, my presentation. So. Since my perspective draws heavily on La Planche, I consider gender to be a translation of the adult's polymorphic infantile sexuality and an attempt to regulate the too muchness of the drives. While gender distinction precedes the discovery of the perceptual anatomical sex difference, it does not, const it does not constitute a primary formation since it is preceded by the primitive anarchy of partial drives, oral, anal, and paragenital. Hence, in the beginning, there was a polymorphous infantile sexuality. Secondarily translated into bisexuality that bore the sexualized marks of the social distinction between man and woman, which, which was implanted into the child's psyche by a constellation of seducing caregivers and other inciting and over inciting others, uh, adults, sorry. This is my proposal for the link between gender, sexuality and bisexuality, which is another controversial Freudian notion that you criticize as utterly binary and reductive. Well, you can clearly see that for me, bisexuality is not primary as argued by Freud, uh, but rather a secondary uh, formation. I would like to discuss another point. You show brilliantly the astonishing relevance of the 1905 version of the three essays to contemporary debates about sex and gender by emphasizing the pleasure-based, non-functional, and non-objectal infantile sexuality, its vital need for variation, and its emancipation from developmental ideals and a normative stageism. Notwithstanding its revolutionary potential, does this radically ipsocentric conception of sexuality not have its own limits? Can we think of shame and disgust, for instance, in terms of endogenous reactions as described in the first essay? I very much like the concept of um, intimate socius introduced by Laplanche in order to define a constellation of seducing unconscious driving caregivers 
who as cultural purveyors inscribe the social on the bodily ego of the child. We can easily imagine that the repression of the originally polymorphous excitements in favor of some scarce, overprivileged erogenous zones stems from this primary into subjective communication. I would like your thoughts on this perspective which draws on the theory of tribes and is concomitantly relational. Let me finish by making a brief comment on your central thesis of a non-ethical psychoanalysis, free from good enough family structures. I love this quote. <laughs> uh, despite Freud's revision of the Oedipus complex in 1923, um, in his prominent paper, The Ego and the Id, which emphasizes cross-identifications and desires, there is a persistent fantasy in the Freudian corpus of the positive Oedipus, namely the heterosexual and cisgender outcome, suggesting that the negative Oedipus is theoretical at best. I'm wondering, however, whether we should wholly dismiss this complex from our conceptual arsenal, since we are frequently confronted with it in clinical experience. Perhaps we should rather situate the ethical polarities within um, larger complexities. And instead of recognizing these polarities as primal and universal subjective experiences, consider them to be social and cultural codes that serve to contain the anarchy of polymorphic infantile sexuality. Well, I totally agree with you, Herman, when you spoke in your presentation about an Oedipal complex which desexualizes. Um, I'm going to stop here, but I would like to congratulate you once again for your splendid book, which puts thought to work in the sense given to the word by Foucault when he wrote that working consists of thinking of something that had not previously been thought. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you for your, uh, for your uh, brilliant intervention, I would say. And you raise a lot of questions. I'm, I'm, af I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're not, we're not able to answer all the questions in detail. Um, and there's a lot to respond to. Um, um, I think uh, I, will, I will say a little about your first remarks, uh, if, uh, if that's okay about the methodology. I think that was quite spot on the way that you reviewed our uh, methodology. Um, and uh, about uh, opening, uh, uh, showing the tensions, the contradictions, the inconsistency in order to show the complexity and not, uh, let's say, take uh, and not to fixate in uh, ideological or dogmatic positions, because that would be the point of the controversy that you mentioned. Um, maybe, maybe I could say a few things about what you said about beta analysis and link that to your last remark on the Oedipus complex. Because, and then maybe Philippe can say something else about some of the other issues that you raised. But I was thinking, uh, because of, uh, indeed we highlighted this idea of pato-analysis, uh, the, the idea of a clinical anthropology that you can understand human being or part of stru structure, certain structures and dynamics that, uh, that are uh, general for human beings, that would be Freud's position. You can understand them and describe them from their caricatures. That would be the different psychopathologies. Uh, so hysteria would show us something about what would be generally human and obsessional neurosis would equally do so. Paranoia also and melancholia also, but different structures and different complexes uh, because the different psychopathologies are exactly <laughs> that, mainly different. And so in their variations, in, in, in their differences, they would show some aspects of uh, human psychic life in general. 
uh, and and the idea from Freud, you could say the Freudian idea, although of course he didn't coin the term Plato analysis himself, would be that you can exactly do that through studying the caricatures, the, the magnifications, the exaggerations. And um, I think what we try to show is not only that that that, that is a plausible idea uh, to, to, to say what Freud is doing is, is offering a kind of possibility for a pato analysis of human existence. But I think we also try to show to a certain extent the limits of, pato, of the pato analytic approach. So in the first three essays edition, to study sexuality from, his, from the perspective of hysteria leads to a certain conceptualization of sexuality uh, along the lines of you could say the hysterics dynamics and 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 reaction and the reaction formations so, uh, uh, the, 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 and, and sling to Dora I'm not going to in the complexity of that but the orality the shame and disgust uh, especially these reaction formations are linked with hysteria um, but I think we also show the limits of the Peto analytic project. And one of the limits is that uh, as soon as Freud strengthens his developmental approach in his writings, he introduces a more normative approach to sexuality and sexual development. And the pato-analytic approach is uh, 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 put in the back, you could say, uh, weakened. The other way of weakening pato-analytic approach is probably through the process of oedipalization of his theory. And that's how I would link uh, the issue of pato analysis to what you, your final remarks on the Oedipus complex. Maybe the Oedipus complex should not be thought of so much in universal or universalistic terms, but more in cultural terms, but maybe even more in pato analytic terms, in the sense that maybe the Oedipus complex would be the typical obsessional neurotic complex. And then the Oedipus complex, you would even further <laughs> reduce its importance in a certain sense. The Oedipus complex would still, according to a pathoanalytic approach, be uh, something that can be used to understand a certain, uh, a certain complexity within the psychic uh, uh, within the psychic life of human beings, but it would not describe the full psychic life of human beings, and it would not describe the full psychic life of all human beings, because there would be other complexes and other models that could also be used. So to limit it in that sense would be, I think, equally interesting. But that is, of course, something that Freud is not doing. It would be interesting to further think the notion of pato analysis relative to the Oedipus complex and the position that it got within the psychoanalytic theory. Um, so that would be one thing uh, that needs to further, I mean, that, that could be further explored. Uh, that's one remark. Um, maybe maybe uh, Philippe would like to add something to that and also to the topic of perversion and perversity, maybe. You have to turn on the microphone. Voilà. Yes, uh, I, I, I was thinking of perversion and perversity, aren't we all, all the time? And um, I um, and and so, but I will be short, uh, and because I agree completely with what, what Herman uh, just said about uh, the Oedipus complex, um, and and how to to rethink it and limit its um, its scope, or if I don't know how to say it in proper English, but it's uh, what, I, what Herman said. So I would like to, so, so but, but, and I will I'll try to be short, not uh, so that there, that there is still some time for uh, uh, the audience to ask questions. First of all, uh, uh, Nicola, thank you very much for your uh, intervention. Uh, and, and it was very rich, very complex. And uh, so I, I, I won't be able to do justice to all of that uh, in my, 
in my remarks, but uh, thanks, any, uh, thanks a lot anyway. Uh, first of all, maybe before I say, I say something on perversion and perversity, because I think that's, that's extremely important, I think, for what we were trying to do, uh, the, the um, problem of that distinction. But first of all, the relation to La Planche, because uh, you, you know, I mean, we, we both share um, uh, a great uh, uh, love for La Planche. I, I mean, um, um, I, and, and I think that my interest, uh, my own interest in Lacan, in, in Freud, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, that's a slip, my own uh, interest in Freud um, is, is definitely uh, uh, comes from uh, or is mediated or started in my, my systematic reading of, of Laplanche many, many years ago. So I, I completely, I mean, uh, Laplanche is, 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 is important to me as it is uh, to you, I think. But I, there is one thing that I, I do think that what distinguishes our reading from Laplanche's, that is, I think our reading is much more uh, uh, a historical one. I, 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 uh, the, the more I read Freud, the less I trust Laplanche as a reader of uh, of Freud, um, and and which is not in itself a critique, because of course like Laplanche is a thinker of his own, of its own. But um, I, 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 when he's when he reads Freud against Freud, and when we read Freud against Freud, that's not the same. I think I think there is a difference in the sense that we read Freud, we try to read Freud against Freud the way Freud did that himself. In the way uh, Hermann uh, uh, reminded us, for instance, uh, with regard to Jenseits, that is that Freud, in the same text, is not afraid to change to change his positions, and to show well there is another possibility, and this other possibility is not the one that I develop well in the case, for instance, of Jenseits. What I said in the first five uh, chapters, well, you know, there is another possibility, and then comes the sixth chapter that he. Uh, as we uh, know through the work of, 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 of uh, Ulrike that he published, that he wrote a year later than the rest and so on. So, it's, so but it's, that's Freud against Freud, but it's, it's um, two positions that Freud uh, articulated himself. And the same is a bit true with, with, with three essays. It's different positions that Freud articulated himself. What Laplanche does, I think, interesting as it might be, so it's not, I mean, this is not like, oh, he's wrong and this and that. That's not what I'm saying. In that sense, it remains true. There is no last word, but um, um, it's another position. But um, in Laplanche, of course, is more systematically, as is Lacan, eh, looking for passages in Freud that, um, that illustrate um, his preconceived position. Uh, the, famous, the famous passage, uh, for instance, it, at the beginning, I think, of the summary of three essays, eh, that the, the caregivers take the, the child as a fully-fledged sexual object. Um, it takes that out of the text. It's very fruitful. That's very interesting. But it's a different way of putting Freud against Freud than, than we do. So in that sense, I think Laplanche's methodology cannot just be identified, or methodology, I'm sorry, I mean, uh, and has to respect hierarchy. Um, so uh, I think our methodology is not just to, uh, cannot just be identified with Laplanche precisely because we, 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 have, a, we have another, uh, the, the stakes are different for us. I think what we, what we try to do is show how the historical Freud remains a contemporary. Um, without correcting, correcting him through Lacanian, because in Laplanche is, is a lot of Lacanian inspiration, whether one likes it or not, um, or Kleinian, whatever, inspiration. Uh, there is some après coup going on, and there I agree, that is that the problem that we read, of course, uh, um, that, we, that our reading of Freud, and especially the choice of the text, is, uh, comes from, let's say, problems that we are confronted with today, and that will make, that, that's, that's the step to the next point, uh, that the problems we have today with regard to, to sexual policy, let's say, and of course, that inspires, and that, that is a kind of, that's the perspective from out of which we read or reread Freud, but we do that in a much more historical way, as I just said, then, then Laplanche does. So that would be a first, my first remark then, with regard to perversion and perversity. You know, there is, um, I think the, 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 
the um, Freud, of course, destroys or, I don't know, uh, criticizes that distinction because that distinction, of course, is, is inherited from the sexological tradition um, in which, and then for, and, and, and so perversion then is the disease, if you allow me to, to, to say so, and the perversity, that's the moral category. Huh? That's how it is in, in Kraftebi. Now, um, and Freud, of course, Freud, and, and it, the problem is it, it is reintroduced very, very quickly in this kind of, so it, 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 it implies a kind of perversity um, immediately is, is a moral category. And um, so I think the, the important thing with Freud is that he says, well, after all, perversion is not a moral category, at least in 1905 edition. It's a matter of fixation to... Uh, it's a fixation to uh, pleasurable experiences. And uh, we are all, in a, uh, to a lesser or more degree, fixated to these pleasures. Yeah? And that's all there is about. That, that's all there is to say about it uh, for Freud in, in the first edition, I think. Um, so that's then precisely when you, when you refer to variation and so on. So that's, it's variation and that's all. Um, I, I, I find that uh, uh, also in, 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 in contemporary debates an interesting, at least an interesting perspective, because if you look, for instance, at, uh, yeah, I'll do it, I'll, I'll say it anyway, to Lacanian theories of perversion, it is as if, it is sometimes as if good old Augustine is back. <laughs> and um, so it's extremely normative. Um, it's extremely, um, uh, it's even more than, than, than normative. Eh? It is, it is, uh, it's a pure rejection sometimes if you read uh, some texts and there are reasons in Lacan to read it like that. Interestingly enough, I recently just checked uh, a handbook, a Lacanian handbook in which Freud is criticized for his theory of subject, of, of, perver of perversion because you can no longer make the distinction between perversion and perversity. I thought I fell off my share. And um, so, <laughs> you know uh, how, how I think about it. So I do think that it's important to keep that distinction, to, to not to, 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 to criticize that distinction and to look and, and to keep the, the, the early Freudian theory of perversion in mind uh, as an antidote to um, old and new ways of um, moralizing. So that's my, my first reflection. That being said, as you know, um, I think that I have this fantasy and I, well, I, I, I already for many years, I hope to write an article on that, but it, it, it just doesn't work. And, I, and, and because I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the literature on, on, on transgender and so on. But I think if Freud would, so my, my question is, what, how would Freud, if Freud would be alive today, what would, his three essays look like if he would write it today? What would be, how would he conceive of it? And of course, if you look at the first chapter of three essays, uh, homosexuality plays a crucial role in it. It's, it's half, of the, half of the first chapter. And of course, homosexuality was a big issue in, in those days. And Freud knew the, these debates uh, and someone was familiar with it. That's also what I meant of one of, one of the things I thought of when I, when I mentioned uh, to, to Ulrike in response to Ulrike's uh, re, uh, remarks that actually we were very much thinking about Freud in relation to contemporary debates, for him contemporary in psychiatry, homosexuality was a big issue. It is no, no more for good reasons, um, but transgenderism is and plays in a certain sense the same role now as homosexuality played in Freud's days, in, the psychiat in psychiatric and social and political debates. So maybe if Freud would live today, he would rewrite um, um, three essays, starting, taking a starting point in transgenderism, and that would bring me to your question, if then he would follow this patroanalytic approach, he would, and I, I, I think, there is something to be, to be said for that. He would say, well, actually, transgenderism 
as it is described in, in sexuological, sexuological and psychiatric handbooks, um, is nothing but a taking into the extreme of a problem we all have. So there is no essential difference between me and the trans, and the trans person. Uh, the trans person confronts me with something that is a problem that I have myself too. Fortunately, I found and we all find some kind of a solution to that problem. And maybe the rejection that the transphobia and so on uh, you, you referred to um, um, finds, at least partially, its, uh, its origin there. It's too close. Um, but that's only, I mean, it's, it's a remark, I mean, but, but it's a kind of, if, if so, <laughs> it's, it's also, it's, it's, a, it's an article I would really like to, 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 to write, as, as you know, but, but boom, it's, it's very complex. It's, not, it's, it's easy to say it as a project, something else is to develop. Um, yeah, I think maybe I'll, I'll stop here because otherwise, uh, but that would be two, uh, three even uh, quick remarks uh, with regard to you. To your, uh, inter to your intervention. Thank you. May I add something, uh, Jasper, very quickly before? Yeah, very quickly, because... Uh, uh, first of all, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an addition to what Sir Philippe was just saying, that would also mean, if that is true, what Philippe is saying now, and that's suppose that is unlikely as it sounds, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that would also mean, of course, if you look uh, and it from a kind of a Foucauldian perspective on the history of sexuality that something would have changed right because homosexuality is part of the perversions that have to do with the sexuality that is takes its norm in reproduction whereas transgenderism would confront us with the problem of sexual difference and there is something probably something in our own culture has shifted <laughs> there if that would be uh, now in the focus of a kind of a Freudian look on sexuality, that we are no longer so much concerned with reproduction, but with the question of sexual difference mm. and with what is masculinity and what is femininity. Um, I would like to add one, uh, one point to what you said about the limits of the theory of sexuality and whether, and whether shame and disgust can be set totally apart from, let's say, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the primary expectations uh, in relation to objects such as parents. Uh, I think what we try to show in our work that already in 1905 Freud uh, 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 is confronted with the limits of his own radical proposal. It never really works in a sense, and to a certain sense it, it does. Uh, it never works because some of the polymorph perverse building blocks of infantile sexuality are themselves already inherently object related, such as sadism and fetishism and voyeurism. Uh, at the same time, I think we should take very serious that he tries to define infantile sexuality in physiological processes. So to say shame and disgust have a place within a non-objectal sexuality means that they should can be explained from reaction formations that are spontaneously and inherent to a non-objectal sexuality. And this confronts Freud, I think, with a problem that runs through his whole career, namely the question, how can pleasurable experience become unpleasurable yeah, if the unpleasure cannot be cannot be uh, uh, caused by external factors. No. We have to find an inner cause for this transition from something pleasurable in something unpleasurable. I think that's a key question in Freud's work uh, that, that follows him throughout his career, you could say. He constantly returns to that problem and I think he never really finds an accurate answer to it either. Mm. But um, in that sense, I think we have to take this idea of the reaction formations, these physiological processes, and the imminent, uh, the imminency of the reaction formation is very serious because it reveals a central uh, question and problem in the, the whole Freudian work. Mm. Yeah. It's just, okay. Well, I agree completely, yep. Okay. Yeah, we will give the opportunity now for the audience to, uh, 
ask a couple of questions. And I noticed that uh, Patrick van der Meers already notified me that he has a question to ask uh, or a remark to make regarding uh, Jung. Uh, Patrick, are you still there? Your microphone, Patrick. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, let me say I had the pleasure to read the book, and many of the questions I had are already solved. I would like to mention to mention the text of Jung, where Jung tries to show that that he's a real Freudian in 19, 1909 on the importance of the father. When you have in the first publication in psychologic literature, the Oedipus complex. It's strange, it is Jung who, who introduces the Oedipus complex in order to show his faithful to Freud. And this text is mostly a no. But then the other question was, and Hermann has a just answer to, to it. Uh, there is, in the beginning of the three essays, a kind of a kind of conflict between the abirungen, the variation of sexual pleasures, and then the homosexuality with a variation in the object, with object relation, and where no link is made to the different erogenic zones. And that's from the beginning on a huge problem. And Hermann has already uh, not given an answer, but said, said that Freud indeed has always struggled with that problem. And I should be, I should, I'm glad to say that. And you find the problem already in the article of Jung about the place of homosexuality in the development. Okay, that was what I wanted to say. Um, yes, thank you, thank you, Patrick. I don't know. Uh, yes, um, I think I think it's 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 a good good thing that you refer to Jung's text of 1909. I think that Ulrike would agree that uh, Jung, of course, plays plays a crucial role in the further development of Freudian theory and sexuality. They have a whole debate in it, on it, as you know better than I do. Of course, you you had a book on it, uh, and. Uh, what what is interesting uh, uh, in the text of Jung is also the way that he relates it, of course, to uh, I mean he not not only introduces the Oedipus complex, but he does so in the context of his own drive theory, at least in its in its embryonic form, uh, a teleological drive, uh, basically, uh, in which in which in which the identification with the parents. Uh, is is basically a hindrance in the in the, in the in the in the in the in the free development of the drive, if I may if I may simply put it in, in simple words, and then also links it to culture and religion, so to a cultural historical uh, influence that plays a role, and I think I mean that is important. Of course, it shows something about Jung, but it also shows something about what Freud became interested in namely the relation between the Oedipus complex and cultural history. Yeah? And that's also why I referred in my introduction to Totem and Taboo, because that's the first moment where you get a full articulation of the importance of the Oedipus complex, but of course in a cultural historical study. Uh, and I think that it was Jung very much who put him on that track in the first place. Uh, or at least played a crucial role in that. Um, with regards to homosexuality, I think that in our book we are we are very uh, try to be nuanced in the sense that or nuanced show the complexity of the phenomenon uh, because and you also notice that that uh, that Freud is very unclear about what exactly he means with homosexuality let alone where it's where it starts how it origin how it originates but also what would be the concrete cases uh, schreber would be a homosexual but is he really a homosexual 
uh, uh, Leonardo would be homosexual, but or have homosexual tendencies, but but in a completely different way. In the three essays, he refers to Greek pederasty as homosexuality, but clearly that is not the same thing. So uh, it is it is remarkably unclear in Freud, I think, what exactly he means by homosexuality and what his uh, let's say his uh, his models are. <laughs> Uh, uh, models in the sense that what 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 is he actually thinking about? Uh, who is he? Who is he picturing here? Uh, so that's just a small remark to uh, your interview. Maybe something, if I may, uh, Jasper, um, uh, quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm very now that you say that, Patrick. There is certainly a, a, a thought that crosses my mind: the place of homosexuality in the three essays. Because I think that's also something you were referring at is very unclear, because it's the first half of the first chapter. The conclusion of homosexuality is the object is variable. Yeah. 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 But. Then comes the study of the perversions, and the perversions all have an infantile, are linked to infantile sexuality, which is not the case in the same way, I think, with homosexuality. Um, so, and so, and infantile sexuality has no object. That means that is is autoerotic. That means that homosexuality as a problem is something that occurs for the first time at the moment, at the beginning of puberty. It cannot be earlier because it, has, it implies an object. It even shows us that the object is variable. And then when object-related introduction is introduced, now, namely in the, third, in the third essay, Freud completely forgets about the, well, not completely forgets, but at least it's no longer the starting point, uh, the first page of the third essay, of the third uh, chapter, there he, he takes a kind of heteronormative position again, as if he never said that for adult sexuality, because it can only be about adult sexuality, because only adult sexuality is objective, the object is variable. So it's very, I mean, it's, so um, it just crossed my mind that also from that perspective, it's extremely, um, um, well, interesting also, because it's, it's, once again, I mean, the more I read Freud, the more I love him. It's, <laughs> no, it's also very interesting, an author that, 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 you know, that his own perplexities, so to speak, are, are in the text. So you can, you can start from here and say, okay, what's going on? Because it's quite often our own perplexities, and and uh, so, but but bon, to to come to so, so the fact that he just there is a very there is some great honesty in that um, in 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 Freud, uh, but, but I think also from that perspective, the status and the place of homosexuality um, uh, is very um, unclear, uh, both in terms of definition and so on. Uh, also, is there a theory of sexual of homosexuality in Freud? It, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. So I, well, I, I, I look at, uh, at Ulrike, even if she cannot see that I look at her uh, to know, but I would, I would be very uh, uncertain about that. Um, so somebody, a bon entendeur, salut, uh, has to find out. But I don't know whether what, what you think about what I just said. Patrick. I, I agree completely. And the, the basic question is, of course, and here I become a little bit Foucauldian, uh, do, don't we put together in homosexual and homosexuality very different things? Just as we put different things together in BDSM. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Ulrike, did you want to respond to the, the last question of uh, Philippe, or do I have someone else? Uh... I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I could follow you as closely as I should, um, uh, but I, I would like uh, to come back to what I said before. In my understanding, Freud, for Freud, homosexuality was the key. Uh, to uh, narcissism yeah, yeah. because this was the crucial idea that he said well uh, how can we explain homosexual cases and Ch uh, Satka just had presented one uh, and there are I'm, 
I remember that Freud had Jot Vt and so on, homosexual men uh, in, in his uh, practice. Okay, he, he believed that he had that he had to change his theory because of homosexuality. He had to change the theory of 1905 and he had to give an, a new answer. It was not enough to explain everything and this is a point where I do not mm. agree with you 100%. Uh, he felt that he did not that it was no good idea to reduce homosexuality to the relationships to father and mother and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, this is just not right because the main thing in homosexuality seems to be, as he thought, uh, that they love somebody who is very similar to they them how do you say it to themselves they love the penis and they cannot live love anything else and this is why i have to change my theory and i have to introduce a complete new face yeah the narcissistic face uh, in order to uh, to to take into consideration my impression what homosexuality is about. Homosexuality, he thought, he had it also, he hinted at that solution in the Kleiner Hans already. Yeah, there is a, there are some lines where he said something like that already. But then in 99, he was sure that he had to expand his theory and to say, this way of love is as important as the way we love mother, but it's different because we love something that is like us. Whereas in the love of mother, we love somebody, he was mainly thinking of the boy as always, he will love something that is different from us. Mm. No. I don't know if, uh, if if I'm I have missed the point uh, completely. I don't hope so. Yeah. Well, I, I should I should like to add, in 1909 and 1910, he goes with Ferenczi to Sicily. He's writing the Schreber, and he he writes, oh, I'm not homosexual enough to accept." such a passivity yeah. of this charming guy <laughs> so that's something different than than pure narcissism yeah yeah i don't know but i remember that that uh, uh, these lines they were very funny and i think that freud knew that he that he had to think about his own homosexuality as we all have to and he thought that he had conquered it in a better way than <laughs> than many other uh, people he escaped uh, open homosexuality but he said that, that it is necessary for men to be able to love men and uh, um this is something that he uh, he criticized on his pupils if they are, were not able to love another man. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm... Just a note, I was in Sicily, in Syracuse. I slept in the same hotel as Freud with a good yeah. friend. And there I read the Schreber and also uh, what is told about his, his journey to, to Italy. Okay. But it was not only the passivity. What he didn't like in Ferenczi, as far as I remember, was that Ferenczi didn't want to put down what Freud told him to put down. Ferenczi didn't want to be the servant of Freud. And afterwards, after the journey, Ferenczi said, well, I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't submit to you. Submit. Yeah? And, uh, and this was, 
silly. I was silly that I couldn't do it. Yeah, it's a mixture of homosexual and uh, well. Okay, uh, I'll finish it. Okay, I think we have uh, still room for one last question from our audience. No, everybody's satisfied already. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So I think I think we'll uh, we'll end our uh, our discussion here. I want to thank uh, Philip and Herman again for the wonderful presentation and our uh, respondents uh, for their interesting suggestions and all of you for attending our uh, our discussion. The last thing I have to mention is that there will be a next uh, book discussion on the 17th of uh, April with uh, Bruno Vincent on his uh, new book, uh, Lacan, Style des Écrits, with, um, together with um, Paolo Beer and uh, Danny Nobis, the 17th of April. Okay. Thank you. Voilà. Hope to see you uh, see you all again on another occasion. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you very much for presenting and hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nika. Thank you, uh, Nicola. Thank you also, Jasper, Lea, Paolo, for organizing. Highly appreciated. Uh, uh, see some of you very soon, I hope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.